All right, we're cooking, Will Hogue. It's great to see you, man. Um, we met originally a couple of years ago on the Rock Boat, which is a, a floating rock festival on the ocean. Yeah. Um, and I think I believe we had a quick, brief chat, kind of bonded over the the game of basketball. I understand you're you're a bit of a baller in your day. You still hoop? Uh, as much as an old ass man with half a leg can hoop, yeah, I try. <laughs> you play basketball with a peg leg? That's pretty sweet. It's uh yeah, it's uh it's a real gift, man. How about you? You still playing? I'm trying to get back into it. Um, you know, I yeah, uh, I kind of took a semi-retirement because I was like leaving the gym, just getting too pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> like I just take it, I take it too seriously, <laughs> even in like chump rec ball. Um, it's like I'm a pretty like non-confrontational person and pretty shy, but that is like the one place where I just have like some primal rage left in me or something <laughs> that's healthy but, man uh, that's good yeah my brother's you know, a, my... is a pro yeah go ahead no you go ahead my brother's a pro basketball coach uh he's coaching in the czech republic in the in the czech pro league um but he's actually moving home next month and he can really play he's he played uh in the asian pro league for a year and oh, so wow. when he comes back I'm going to come out of retirement when he comes back because then we can actually get in there and start winning a bunch of games. Yeah, I've been trying to play. My youngest son is is kind of into it now, and um, we got a little gym up the street, and so we go up there, and I'm trying to get him in to play, like, pickup ball. My youngest son's 13, and so I'm trying to get him, like, look, when you play with older kids and grown-ups, like, you're going to get better when you go to play with your other 13-year-olds, and I was yeah. like, it's not, and he's like, I don't really want to play. Like, these guys are too big. And I was like, it's not bad. And we got in there the first day, and a fight broke out during the game. Like, two guys <laughs> yeah. started going at it. And he's like, I don't want to do this. I was like, oh, okay. that ain't a foul, man. That ain't yeah, a I was foul. Like, it was totally that. And it was like, man. Uh, so I don't miss that part of it. But uh, yeah, I still like to play. Yeah, that is a um, that is a tough middle ground to find because you want to play with people better than you. You want to get your ass kicked a little bit, but you don't want your confidence to get so shot. Um, you know, yeah. I remember playing like in the in the AAU leagues. You know, like just yeah. with guys jumping over the rim, dunking, and uh, I was just pretty undermatched. You know, not enough quickness, and that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it helped my game, but I mentally it was like wasn't a great boost to morale just to get dunked yeah. on with a And then, you know, you get to face. a point too, where it's like, when you're doing this for a living, it's like the last thing I want to do is have to cancel the tour because I broke my wrist playing pickup yeah. basketball. Like th those are things that I, you know, you never would have thought about years ago. And now there's a little bit more uh, forethought into the whole thing of whether it's worthwhile or not. Even spraining in an ankle, which in theory <laughs> would be an issue, but you're like, well, how am I going to haul this like 40 yeah. pound amp 400 times right. this month? You know, with this stupid looking plastic boot on. Yeah, that's not the way you want to do it. <laughs> did you play in high school or college? What was kind of your trajectory? I did. I played through high school and then I wasn't in college long enough to do anything. So, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't play in college. And it was uh, outside of Nashville? Yeah, I grew up just just south of Nashville in a little town called Franklin. I bet they take uh, sport pretty seriously down there. How was hoops taken seriously? Yeah, you know it was a really interesting time. I mean, growing up when I did, there was just now you know Nashville was still small. Tennessee was, but there were a lot of really great athletes. You know, there were a lot of guys that went on to play. At a, at a higher level, kind of across the state, it was a really fertile time here for athletics, which was was fun, you know, and everybody kind of still knew one another, uh, but it was pre-internet, so you sort of knew of one another more than you knew one another, uh, which was fun. Yeah, it was a great yeah. time to have, have come up here and been, and been participating in all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, it was like uh, you would you would hear myths about this like player across from the other conference, yeah. and like it would almost be intimidating because you would know nothing about them, and then they'd show up. But uh, what were you tapped into the music scene as a as a high school kid, or did that come a little bit after school? It, I mean, it, it came large. I mean, really being in any sort with it came after i didn't get a guitar and really start doing musical stuff until i was a senior late junior or senior in high school um i had grown up with music as a 
my dad had been a musician. My uncles had been musicians kind of in that post Beatle mania. Everybody got a guitar and started bands and, and they really did it. You know, they sort of played the regional circuit in the Southeast and they had, it was sort of like that thing you do. I mean, they were these bands, they would go make 45s and somebody sign them to a deal and they'd get a little bit of exposure. So I was always around music. And one of the great things about growing up in and around Nashville is that, you know, music is, it's kind of a part of everything. I mean, so everybody's in some way, shape or form kind of exposed to the music business because it was a small enough town again. And, you know, you knew somebody that was an artist or a drum tech or a guitar player. And so I was always sort of, uh, I was a fan of music, but I wasn't really into being in bands. I mean, I was, I had little middle school and high school kind of knock around bands playing in people's garages and stuff like that. But it was until college when I realized I just didn't like school. Um, and I did like trying to write songs. And then I jumped into it kind of with both feet at that point. Were you like the class clown or like the one of the all, honorable mention all delinquents in uh, high school? How did that go? Yeah, I was. I mean, I think I had a lot of, um, you know, looking back. Yeah, it was a lot of a lot of that, I think, was just anything trying to mask not fitting in and not feeling like I knew who I was. You could make up for that. I mean, I wouldn't, I guess you either act like a big, tough jock asshole and I wasn't big enough for that. So I was going to have to just be a clown to mask uh, my loneliness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Did, did you, do you remember a moment in class where like you got a big laugh for the first time and you kind of got addicted to it? Oh, sorry, I lost you. Oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're wild. A moment in kind of, class where what? A moment in class where uh, you got a big laugh kind of for the first time, and you're like, oh, I need to do more of this. Man, I think there were probably, yeah, there was lots of those things, I think, when, when I was even younger, I think elementary school kind of stuff. I mean, getting a laugh from somebody was always a a highlight, I feel like. And I remember, you know, it was, there were a lot of lessons also with learning. Like I remember being in junior high and there was a football coach that was a big guy. And, you know, this, they still let you paddle kids in school and stuff. And he was notorious <laughs> for, you know, paddling the kids that acted up. And I didn't ever want that because as funny as I thought I was, I was not tough like that. And uh, yeah. I remember making a joke in class and the class laughed. And I also knew right then, I was like, I am in trouble. Like, Coach Smithson is getting ready to light my ass up. And he walked over to my desk and he leaned down. And I remember him going, I should take you in the hall and paddle you. But that was really funny. But if you do it again. <laughs> and I was just like, got it. So, uh, you know, I think nice. learning the line of funny versus getting your ass whipped is an important one that I had to learn pretty early on too. Man, Paddleman didn't lucky. He had a little bit of a sense of humor, you know, good, good Lord. Thank goodness. Yeah. Cause I don't have the ass for paddling. It wouldn't have been good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got a skinny bony ass myself. It, yeah. So weird. Yeah, I like, have broke. Yeah. It wouldn't have been good. My dad talks about like, just getting like, like hit with like, rulers by nuns and stuff just like a wild air where you could just yeah. legally beat kids in school yeah. or something else it's strange and you know and now with my own kids i mean my, like my boys are 13 and 16 and the when we even talk about that i feel like your teachers would just spank you in school like strangers it's like <laughs> yeah it's it's not okay i don't i'm not i'm not saying it was a grand old time but yeah it's it's crazy to think that that was a thing that we just did yeah it's easy to take it like enough beatings from your peers like we don't need more from you know mr yeah Pettyman. like state sanctioned ones is just unnecessary it's just, yeah <laughs> so what's next for you musically are you uh you got any uh big ambitions or goals with the year yeah, well, I've got a new record that's coming out on Friday. Um, and so I've got some tour stuff coming up through um, 
the fall with that, which I'm really excited about. And then tomorrow to finish another new, uh, that's a solo record that I've got coming out on Friday. And then I've got a band record. I'm going in with some other musicians to finish that uh, starting tomorrow. So I'll have that all done in the next couple of weeks. And then I've got some production stuff coming up uh, on a handful of other records that I'm really excited for other artists to be a part of. And yeah, it's a busy little time. It's good. Good. And uh, do you feel pressure when all that stuff comes out and you like put in all this work toward an album and then you got the rollout and you got to do the pods and the radio and the TV and all that and, uh, you know, get the band in order, get the finances in order. Does that, is that something you stress about or you just kind of just whatever? Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not stress, but it's also not whatever. I mean, I, I think there used to be a lot more stress. I think that one of the beauties of, you know, there's a lot of things that people will complain about with getting older and, and things like that. But I think that some of that in this situation has been really beneficial. Um, there's a level of patience and understanding. I, I don't stress out about those things like I used to um i've got a whole lot less people to please which makes it a lot easier to not stress um so no it's it's more excitement than stress at this point you know the the work itself i've really come to enjoy and getting to work with other people on their records has been really helpful for me with my own because you know you can sort of you watch somebody else because you still do get artists that I'm working with that maybe are stressing about certain things. And then when you sort of help them through those moments and calm them from the production chair, you know, it's hard not to take that forward into your own work and go, wait a minute. Uh, the same way I was telling them about this, I have to sort of instill that into myself too. So no, it's not stressful. It's really, really exciting. Um, and I'm always excited to, you know, have another project to work on. Where where was it in your musical trajectory early where you're like, you know, you talked about kind of goofing off and playing garage bands. What was the moment or a handful of moments where you're like, oh, this is like something that could maybe be a job or a part-time job. I'm going to double down. Well, I mean, there was an initial thing. I remember the first time of really playing in front of people and I was probably 10th or 11th grade. And it was the first time of like, whoa, there's something that's like magical and tingly about this. And so there was that, you know, which is the sort of first step into I should do this a little bit more. Um, but then there was, you know, and that carries you for a, a few years, but even a couple of years into it. I remember the first time like writing my own uh there was a really great product in and around Nashville. His name was Barry Beckett. He was part of the Muscle Shoals thing and had moved to Nashville. He was a keyboard player and a record producer here. He had a son named Mark that's a great drummer, still plays on the Grand Ole Opry and all of that. And, you know, when you're in that phase, we were just writing songs and trying to put a band together. I didn't know what I was doing. There was no real plan. It was just throwing shit at the wall. But I remember. I remember being at Mark's house. It was me playing guitar and singing and him playing drums and you're thinking of songs. And I remember his dad, Barry, who was like I say, this phenomenal musician. I remember the first time he walked through and he asked, he was like, what, what was that song? And, I, you know, as a teenager, it was, I mean, a late teen, probably. Was. He was like, it's this thing I wrote. And he was like, man, that's really good. And I remember thinking at that point, like, I wonder if this is something you could do for a living. Like, I'd never really thought about that. I just thought it was this thing that you kind of did for fun and, sure. you know, rock star dream kind of shit. But to then go like, huh, what would that really yeah. look like? That was kind of my first moment of like, I wonder if there is a, like, is this a job? Can this be a job? And I guess 30 years later, I'm still asking myself that question a couple of times a week. It must have been a holy shit moment. Like I can like sort of goof off for a living. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is some of that. I mean, and that's, you know, that's the healthy balance is like, what is the, what is the goof off amount that kind of keeps you young and excited about doing this balanced with, you know, how do you support a 
family and have a wife and kids and a home and a a life that you're not burned out in the gutter at 55. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's the, that's the balance, but yeah, I mean, in, in some ways goofing off for a living, uh, is, is pretty good work if you can get it. Yeah. And how did you, uh, did you have to do anything to kind of maintain and go the distance, you know, being 30 years in, did you have to quit the, quit the sauce or diet or what, whatever it is, two or less. Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, the sauce was never a factor for me. I was never a drinker, which has been a real blessing for my health, physically, mentally, my pocketbook as well. Uh, I come from a long line of alcoholics. So uh, that's a good one to have dodged. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you continue to do it, I do think that it, it, even if you are a drinker, I think that just starts to become less and less a thing. I mean, I remember when I would be around, uh, it seemed like the more localized you were with the musicians that were just playing on the weekends, those were the ones that were party and harder and all of that. And then you'd go out and you'd, sure. you'd be backstage with some major rock band. You know, you watch the Rolling Stones guys backstage and it's like, man, they're exercising and eating well and like stretching <laughs> before the show. Like, oh, if you want to do this, at a real level for a long time, you've got to take care of yourself. And mental health is thankfully, I, I say this as the husband of a therapist, uh, you know, mental health, I think in this business in particular has become a, a bigger and more important focus. Um, yeah. And I think that's a huge thing too. I mean, really trying to take care of yourself uh, and maintain some balance between, you know, the craft and the, and your actual well-being as a human is is pretty important. Have you had, I mean, uh, mentally, have you been pretty solid over your career? Were there were there times where you really had to kind of make changes or make adjustments to kind of just feel better in your head to to kind of keep going? Yeah, I didn't know that for a long time. I mean, early on, I just thought that uh that was something you know when, growing up i think mental health to me was you only went to see a therapist if you you know if your parents were getting divorced or you got some sort of you know you were molested by a scout leader or whatever you went to see a therapist sure. there was something like that you didn't just you know anything else you were just supposed to soldier through and so i did at the uh, an early part of my career I spent a lot of time just masking that uh, and was really pretty fucked up about it. Um, and I didn't even know it. And then it was really, as I met my wife uh, and started to try to really focus on things at home, that's where I started to realize like, oh man, I got, I got some work to do. Um, and it got better in increments. And then COVID of course was, a really dark period, I think for obviously for so many of us. Uh, and I had a really low point there because I also realized that, you know, one of the great things about this as a, you know, the road being in a band, you're, you're sort of, you're forced into relationships and you're forced into vulnerability with kind of the, guys and girls that you're around in your van or in your bus and so i didn't have to i never had to really establish relationships they were just always sort of presented and you connect through that and then there was when that was all gone you know missing the shows and the gigs like i've gotten i've had things that have happened over the years where i've had to miss that and get used to it but i was always able to still connect with folks and i think that during COVID and not having that, that was a really, there was a really low period there where I had to go, uh, I had to go away for a little bit just to kind of get some help and some time and some checking in on all of that. And, and things have been uh, a lot better since then. So that's been really good. And it's just taking continue, you know, it's, yeah, it's a lifestyle well. change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mental health comes in such waves, you know, it's like, 
you think uh, you've conquered something sometimes and you're on the other side and then like six months later you're in a you're in another little battle um and it's not like that for everyone but it, it's certainly been that way on this end um but yeah, you just got to continuously try new things if the things uh, that you're doing are just band-aids or yeah. you know, temporary fixes. So I'm I'm always working on that. It's a it's a constant uh it it, it kicks my ass uh, several times a year, but uh I'll be all right. It good. And are do you see I mean, yeah, what what are your tricks for it? Um, well, yeah, actually I'm getting like, uh, you know, I've done the therapy stuff over the years. I'm going in like next week, I'm going to do a psyche val, which I've never done. I've never talked to a psychiatrist before, um, yeah. it, where they spend like three or four hours and just go in depth on kind of your nuances and your quirks and your, uh, um, neuroses. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that because, um, I've had some friends do that and, um, uh, I just kind of have a hunch and my, the people close to me have a hunch that. Um, that'll be useful just cause I've, you know, I've gone to, to GPs and, uh, you know, you, you get the generalized anxiety, uh, diagnosis, which it almost seems like everyone <laughs> has these days, yeah. but I, yeah. I feel like I have like, I might have like a specific dose of some more like OCD type thing or something, nothing like, um, insurmountable, but I think I'll just have better Intel to be able to kind of tackle it, you know? Good, man. I'm glad you're doing that. And I just, you know, it's another thing I think that just, I mean, outside of the music business, I just think is, as men, it's something that's really important for us to continue to talk about, you know, with one another. I mean, you know, like you said, I mean, you and I, we aren't best friends that get together every holiday or anything like that. But I mean, we're pals enough to, you know, those are things that when we can talk about those things and start to really destigmatize it for the world at large, I think it it moves us all into a whole lot better place. So I'm excited for, I'm, I'm proud of you for doing that, man. I'm, I'm, oh, I think that's going to be really good. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate that. it. Yeah. And it is, it is really cool, uh, to just kind of, you know, meet musicians or, or, or anybody really who is just down to chat about that stuff, especially early on in a conversation or a relationship. It's really kind of a cool litmus test for, uh, Oh, I can, you know, I can jive with this, this fellow right <laughs> yeah, here, you know, right. You're <laughs> fucked up it. too. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah this is easy. <laughs> yeah. Any, any shortcuts through a uh, uh, small talk? I'm, I am all about that. Oh yeah. Right on. So tell me, um, one of the kind of the, the recurring questions on the show, weirdest gigs, um, especially early on bands usually have a funny story of like a uh, meltdown show. Maybe the drummer quits mid mid stage, uh, intra band fights, uh, weirdest venues that creeped you out stalkers, anything bizarro from the road that, uh, that comes to mind. Oh man, there were real early ones. There was a, there was a lady that used to come see us play kind of all over the Southeast and she would, claimed she was a writer for you know whatever some like regional paper was or she was like i'm right and then she would give us these pieces like i've written this and then she would put us up in hotels she would be like stay at this hotel i'm gonna interview you just eat and drink like everything's free it was like and it was in the early 2000s so there was still a little bit of like rock journalism was still a thing so it wasn't it didn't seem ridiculous and uh, man, we'd live it up on stakes and these nice hotels. And this went on for, you know, this was at a time when we were working all the time. You know, you'd go out for three and four weeks at a time and she'd show up at eight gigs, you know, in a month, 10 gigs in a month and do these interviews and had microphone, you know, it seemed official. And then this all went yeah. on. And then one night it just came up that she'd just been stealing people's credit cards she didn't have a gig she just had bought a tape oh recorder was recording these interviews and paying yeah. for hotels so we lived like kings for about <laughs> three months and and never got an interview out of it but the food was pretty good yeah <laughs> yeah so that yeah, well, was weird well, sort of guilt-free for you you didn't do anything yeah no that's, uh, no I, that's we didn't quality know. that's the kind of hard hitting people's that... credit cards we were done so no 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 yeah yeah um but yeah, that's that's the kind of uh, hard hitting, weird stories we need on the show, Will. Well, that's Good what stuff. the world at large is really looking for, right there. The world is so weird, <laughs> and you know, 
this is the weirdest job there is. Um, so what about uh, have you ever you ever get you ever play like any uh, far away bizarro places you never thought you'd get to? Oh, man. I mean, that's kind of I mean, I grew up in a really isolated, you know, my family does not travel uh, as a as a kid. I mean, we would occasionally go. You know, you'd make the seven hour drive down to the beach every couple of summers. Um, and that was it. I mean, it was all the travel that I'd ever done. So, I mean, you know, I didn't fly on an airplane until I was in my late twenties to sign a record deal. Um, so, I mean, honestly, the fact that I get to travel around uh, the world and, and play songs for people, it's all pretty magical. When I really stop and let myself think about it for a second that, you know, um, I got parents that really never leave the you know, 30 miles of where we grew up. Uh, you know, my kids at this point have been to 10 or 12 different countries and traveled the world. So, you know, I mean, that, that whole thing is, is pretty wild when I stop to think about it, really. Just the fact that there's international travel to make up stories to sing to people for a living is pretty magical. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, how far were you into your career where you were you knew you were going to start having kids? Well, um, the first one was an, you know was a surprise, so it wasn't something that was, you know, hey, let's have kids. It was hey, let's have sex, and oops, here's kids. Um, <laughs> but that was you know I was uh, seven probably six records in. I mean, I, you know, and I was, uh, it wasn't something I ever thought I would do. And my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, got pregnant and yeah, we had the baby and about a year later got married and a couple years after that, number two came along and we've nice. just been good. That one was on purpose. Uh, yeah. but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been wild. I mean, that was not something that I ever, I'm glad that it happened the way it did because my wife and I will say, I think that we would have easily talked ourselves out of children because there's always, um, you know, I would have always been like, well, let's do it after this next record. Totally. Or let me get this other totally. tour. You know, there's yep. always a way to talk yourself out of it. And so when it was like, cool, this is what we're doing, you know, it, it is major and massive changes on so many levels. And it also kind of doesn't change any of the work, except that all of a sudden yeah. I think I was probably more focused on, you know, how I wanted to work and when and where I wanted to work. But yeah, it was a wasn't necessarily yeah, that, a premeditated decision. I feel like nine out of ten fellas would probably just prefer to let the universe decide for them, you know, because otherwise, exactly <laughs> yeah. what you're saying. Now ah, let's wait yeah. till 2029. Yeah. I'll be yeah, more stable, yeah. uh, financially, I'm, yada, yada. Yeah. And I'm 60 years old. Like, you know what we should do now? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad it happened how and when it did. Yeah. I'll have so much wisdom, you know, when I'm 65, having my first kid, I'll really be able to. Yeah. Pass I'll have it all figured there. out by then. <laughs> and then you realize as you get closer, you're like, man, we don't have shit figured out still. So. Oh. You never have, uh, you never figure it out, do you? No, I don't think so. And that's the big illusion. You know, I think that was the thing that was one of the funniest thing about having kids was, was that it was like, oh man, nobody knows. Like our parents didn't know what they were doing. Like, yeah. We thought it's like, you think as a kid, you're like, the adults have got it figured out. The adults are just playing grab ass half the time too. Yeah. Adults have the answers. Hoping for I the just, best. I just remember that about like, certain uh teachers growing up or like you know you're just taught to respect authority at all costs at least my my folks were which which is the right the the right way to teach kids but i like looking back look looking at some of the teachers or elders that like were in supervision of us like they were they were nine-year-olds themselves you know it's oh like, yeah uh, i mean yeah it's it's crazy that any of us have made it this far with some of the uh folks that were in charge yeah it's pretty pretty wild to think of do you have a do you have uh any musical heroes you've been working with in nashville i mean that's a, such a great city to be in touch with uh 
all kinds of people you admire. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, there really are. There's so many, I mean, heroes, not necessarily. I mean, you know, one of the, uh, I always go back to Vince Gill as a guy, um, you know, because as I was growing up in Franklin, he had daughters that were the same age as my youngest brother. Um, you know, he was at really the height of his sort of commercial success. He was on the TV all the time on the award shows and great guitar yeah. player, great singer, great songwriter. Um, but he was still around. Like he would be at the basketball games where she was cheerleader and he would be at the award shows for school. And so he was always one. He's still one that I kind of hold up as a, He's still a real normal, good human being and father and husband. I mean, that's one that uh, all encompassing I look at, like that's a way to build a life uh, to be proud of. So that's probably the, really there's tons of different folks, but that's probably the one that I go to the most for um, a vision of, you know, like I said, what a life in this business can look like. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, that, that's something kind of magic about Nashville. It's just like you see like some legend at, in the bleachers at your at your local game, where it's like, yeah. you know, I don't I don't know if the same could be said about like a Milwaukee or that doesn't happen right. in like most places. So. No, and it's funny, you know, people will say that now as Nashville's become more of this tourist destination, you know, people will say that like, if I come to Nashville, you know, where do you go to see the famous people? And the, I mean, the answer is like Whole Foods or or the school pickup yeah. line. It's not anything <laughs> sexy. Like you go downtown, you don't. You stay as far away from downtown as you can. But Fam yeah, famous people a used to be just such a bigger deal. I remember going to New York for the first time when I was like 17 or 18 with my folks. And yeah. my dad, like he was just upset. He just wanted to see like Martin Short or like <laughs> he was just like, all right, like if we keep our eyes open, we'll see Michael Keaton. Um, and he would just get so amped, just like couldn't believe. And then we actually did see Michael Keaton. Like we saw the back of Michael Keaton's head, like walking away from some cue, some line. <laughs> my dad just freaking out. And and, you know, at that point, you know, you're 17, your dad, you feel like your dad knows everything. He's pumped. Yeah. I'm pumped. Yeah, like, I guess I'm excited, Short. right? Batman is Holy over there. God. Yeah. Now, if uh, you saw funny. Martin Short, you, you, you know, I don't know. I guess it'd be cool. But yeah, nobody seems that jazzed about seeing famous people anymore. I could be wrong. No, I think that's another thing that the internet has probably ruined. It's like you could see, because, you know, at that point, like for your old man, like you're saying, I mean, if he didn't see Michael Keaton's movie, he didn't see Michael Keaton anywhere else. There wasn't. Yeah, YouTube totally. and there wasn't all these things. It was like, holy shit! There's the back of Michael Keaton's head. That's a big, it's a big moment for an old man. So, yeah, I guess there is. Yeah, there's like a minor version of that effect still in play. Like, I think if you only see like um, people in that cinematic context and they don't have a social media, yeah. so you can't see all their their human flaws and everything for sure. Like, I went to go see right. Mark Marin uh last yeah. week see him do stand up and the gal who opened Ali Makovsky um I've seen a couple of her specials she's she's really good and kind of dreamy too and I walked right by her and I just totally froze up I was like I was like gonna say hi I was like ah, I can't do it and then I just kind of <laughs> ran away which I don't get I never get that because uh whatever but uh it was kind of funny to feel that feeling you know like starstruck by like a girl who's like a a mid indie level comic who probably makes less money than I do. <laughs> I know, but then it's like that moment of like, you just don't know, you know, and like, I haven't had that years ago. We were touring through California. One of the first times up there, we were driving through Bakersfield and we had stopped at Buck Owens uh, theater just to get a photo outside. And, you know, I was a huge Buck Owens fan growing up. And uh, there was, it was just our van and we were standing there getting a picture and there was an old dually pickup truck in the parking lot. And out of the doors of the, you know, the Crystal Palace comes Buck Owens. And I was like, holy shit, like, it's just us and him on the sidewalk. It's like, this is the perfect moment to say something about what his music and songwriting meant to me and all these things. <laughs> and he walks right up and all I could go, all, I couldn't say anything. And I just said, what time's the show? And he said, seven o'clock. And then he stood there and like waited for us to say something else. And I was just like, that's, that's all I got. And he got in his truck and yep. drove away. I mean, like <laughs> what like, a fucking oh. dummy. Yeah. I was like, well, that's, that was great. Man. And that is funny. I remember, do you ever like see somebody famous that maybe you even admire and then 
don't say anything to them and then like you're like proud of yourself you're like wow that took a lot to not i treated that guy him like out. a peer yeah i treated yeah, him like a yeah, total yeah. peer Real. uh i don't Pat know yeah i saw uh, kurt, kurt russell in line at the airport once he was standing right next to me like to get back into the states in the customs line most regular looking like short dad guy ever i'm like that's motherfucking <laughs> kurt russell and i was like about to like blow his cover and then i'm like oh, no i'm not gonna do that to him <laughs> and i was proud of myself you know it felt that's good. good that's good <laughs> all right will hoke you're the man it's great to talk to you uh you're you're an easy man to connect with and a great musician and i love what you're doing so um let's play one of your later more recent tracks what should we play to kind of close out the show Man, why don't you uh, give them a round of, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of what's on this new record. Why don't you play uh, End of the World here off the new record? Cool. We're going to play Will's cover of R.E.M.'s End of the World as we know it <laughs> right now. Live I feel fine. From the road. <laughs> Great song. I'm sure both songs are killer. All right, Will, I appreciate it, brother. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you on the, on the long and windy road somewhere. I hope so, man. Be good. You too, brother. All right, see you now. All right, man, great, uh, great job, easy peasy. Um, that's all I need. I'll put this out. Uh, what is it, Tuesday? I, I think this will go out next uh, Monday at noon. Well, you just keep it posted. We'll tell you. the, we'll tell the peeps. And then, what are you? Are okay. you on the road? I when are you working again? Are you busy? I'm trying to take a little breather. I kind of, I burned out pretty hard last year i mean I, we're still playing uh just doing less so we'll play like we'll do power weekends in may and then probably uh power weekends in the summer and then next year we'll probably go hard again nice and where yeah. are you living now i'm a milwaukee guy okay cool yeah so we do a lot of we do a lot of midwest stuff and this this uh, i'm sure you've played here a few times but this town kicks ass i, I, like I love it up here. there man well i'll make sure when we're when we hit up that way too i'll uh i'll reach out and uh come hang and say hey that'd be great man we'll drink some coffee or something sounds perfect then if you get to nashville give me a shout absolutely all right, all right we'll, we'll talk to you soon all right Later, see you man bye, bye.